I would say I've just been warned off for saying these few words I'm going to say by a celebrity chef. Uh, I'm glad to say he's now pushed off so I can proceed. I do apologise for reading it. I, I would otherwise get wound up and forget half what I've got to say. Um, so I'll begin by saying, quite irrelevant apparently, but not, in 1972, there were 68 Gloucester cows left in the world. And, uh, and also cheese making in Gloucestershire died out. I was around at that time, so I made it my business to get a couple of cows and milk them and make cheese, because I was concerned about their future. Um, one of the cheese we made, which was extinct, was single Gloucester. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was always the poor man's cheese. It was a cheese that was eaten in the farm in, in, in the county, which is why it had died out. And I started making that again. Right. Um, you might expect single Gloucester cheese to be made from Gloucester cow's milk, but it isn't. And uh, the PDO legislation drafted in 1977, 1997 allows for milk from other breeds to be used. But the aim was to get eventually to get um, Gloucester cow's milk into Gloucester cheese. We've now got seven producers of um, single Gloucester cheese using Gloucester cow's milk. So I think that was a good bit of legislation. It was a bit dodgy in the sense it was sort of passing off, as you might say. But it's come right. It's done what it was intended to do, get the cheese linked to the cows. Now, quite conversely, there was a shortage of, of uh, Gloucester cows and milk, uh, as I said. But quite conversely, there isn't a great shortage of apples in the world. So you, you would expect cider to be made from fermented apple juice. Of course, small producers do just that. They don't know any different. But however, the legislation says only 35% fermented apple juice needs to be used in cider. I think that's appalling. The other 65% percent may be made up with fermented corn syrup or whatever is cheapest on the market at the time. Um, who, who drafted this legislation? Well, you can bet it wasn't my dear friends Tom Oliver or Dennis Watkin, small cider makers. No, it was the big multinationals. And uh, nobody knows about this great big gaping hole in the, in the legislation, least of all people drinking cider. And I think it's appalling. I think it's really naughty. Um, they don't write it on the bottle. And I'll have Alan, Alan Hogan, cider maker, for thank, to, thank me for, to, to, to thank for pointing this out to me. Uh, his cider is made solely from apples. Now, gin. Lots of gin, uh, little boutique gins coming on the market now. Um, most of it is made from neutral or industrial spirit. This spirit can be made anywhere in the world, typically from fermented corn syrup. It's then infused with ever more exotic botanicals to make the latest boutique gin. There are a lot of these drinks on the market currently, and there are even more on the pipeline. This corn-derived neutral spirit can be bought for as little as 10p a litre at 97% alcohol. But there are a couple of notable exceptions. I will add very hastily, because one of them is just over the back, who don't go down this road. They distill from their own fermented product, be it apples, potatoes. And one is Chase over the back there, and the other is Adnams in Suffolk. Those are the only two genuine gin producers in Britain that I know of. All the rest, they're buying in neutral industrial spirit made in massive conurbations, massive sort of, you know, factories. And again, I think it's naughty. You don't know, most people don't know, people in the drinks trade don't know. How are we gonna get away from this addiction to corn? Well, there are a few small distilleries to found in the west of England, dist distilling spirit from fermented fruit, cider, or perry. They could all be said to grow, ferment, distill, and bottle their spirits on estate, on, on, the, on the premises. And I'll just list them, if I may. One is Healy's of Truro, as in the Healy car people. Julian Temple of Somerset, probably very well known to most of you here. Um, ourselves, Charles Martel, that's a surprise. Uh, Chase of Hereford, I've mentioned and Mike Hardingham of Ludlow Vineyard. They are all fermenting their, from the raw material, from apples or whatever uh, other fruit, and they're then f uh, distilling that and getting their spirit. And all the rest, as I say, is, is uh, from in industrial spirit from anywhere in the world, typically from corn syrup or whatever is cheapest at the moment with the most subsidy behind it. 
So this is a plea for the impe imperiled traditional orchard over the cornfield. Corn needs a massive energy input for production from fields which are almost biological deserts. Even more massive amounts of energy are needed for industrial scale transport and distilling of corn. Fruit production, by contrast, needs minimal in uh, mechanical intervention. As a bonus, the trees lock up carbon, as does the permanent grassland in traditional orchards, which are also a haven for wildlife. The fruit just grows year in, year out. I, I can testify to that. Uh, it can be picked by hand, as we do. It's milled by, yes, a machine. After fermentation, it's distilled. And uh, even a couple of distilleries, including our own, is actually wood-fired, which is great fun. Uh, all with minimum transport requirements, as everything can be carried out on one site. The resulting spirits have a traceable provenance, in some cases even to the one individual tree. So next time you sip your 100-year-old single malt whiskey or banana-infused gin, spare a thought for the swallows. You don't find them over cornfields. Thank you. <laughs>